Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome back to NanoHub U's Introduction to Bioelectricity. We are in week four and in this lecture, lecture 4.2, we're going to begin looking at ionic conductances as we did before when we developed the model for uh, the cable model. We're going to do so again and now we're going to be doing it to develop the Hodgkin-Huxley model shown here, but we'll come back to this in a little bit. So in lecture 3.2, we modeled the membrane for the core conductor model, and we modeled it as a series of internal resistors that were per unit length. So Ri was the, in, the impedance inside the cell per unit length multiplied times some uh, length segment delta Z. Uh, and then you had Ro, the impedance outside the cell, times some length segment delta Z. And then between the inside and the outside of the cell, you had some membrane current per unit length, K sub M, that was flowing through a box that we left undefined. And that box is was to be replaced by the equivalent circuit for the membrane itself, which we did in the cable model. And across, uh, measured from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, we also measured the membrane voltage, V sub M. And so this describes one infinitesimally small segment of the membrane. And if we daisy chain a whole series of these together, then we can make some predictions about how uh, membrane voltage, V sub M, and membrane current, K sub M, will relate through the membrane and across the membrane down the length of an axon. So from this, we derived the core conductor equation. And the core conductor equation did just that. It related the membrane voltage to the membrane current by saying that the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to distance was equal to the sum of the resistances per unit length outside and inside the cell multiplied times the membrane current per unit length as a function of both space and time minus RO, the impedance outside the cell per unit length, multiplied times KE, where KE was a current applied by an electrode per unit length, again, uh, but a current applied by an electrode that you could use to stimulate uh, a neuron to either excite it or inhibit it and, and achieve some desired result, uh, mimicking a postsynaptic potential, for example. Once we had that core conductor equation, we went back and we looked at the membrane impedance, the complex impedance, Z sub M, as a function of frequency. And we mapped it out, so we measured it out. And measuring the impedance of the membrane as a function of frequency, we observe a curve that looks like the one shown here, where you have a high value of impedance at low frequencies, a low value of impedance at high frequencies, and a transition region in between. And from that, we deduced that that low value of impedance would correspond to the membrane resistance, where at very low frequencies, all of the current would flow through uh, leakage in the membrane, and that would be quantified as Rm. At very high frequencies, uh, all of the uh, current would flow uh, directly into the cell through a shorting capacitor, C sub M, where that capacitor represented the membrane itself. Remember that the membrane consists of an insulating phospholipid bilayer with a concentration of positively charged potassium ions on one side and negatively charged anions on the other side, and so it looks like a capacitor. And so that capacitor C sub M would represent the transition region, and at some very high frequency, the impedance of the capacitor goes to zero, at which point the impedance is dominated by R sub C. And so we could draw an equivalent circuit where this black box that existed in the core conductor model between the inside and the outside of the cell can be replaced now with an equivalent circuit where you have R sub M, the impedance of the membrane, in parallel with C sub M, the capacitance of the membrane, which is itself in series with R sub C, the capacitance of this intercellular cytoplasm. The next thing we did is we simplified, in lecture 3.4, we simplified that equivalent circuit so that we could get rid of, first of all, we can get rid of R sub C. And the reason we get rid of R sub C is because the only frequencies at which R sub C dominates are well outside, they're well higher than any physiological frequency you're likely to see in a signal. And so it doesn't really matter what the R sub C value is, we know it's small, it never dominates, so we can drop it entirely. The other thing we did is we replaced the membrane voltage with two variables. One was the quiescent voltage, the Nernst voltage for the membrane, minus 65 millivolts, and we can treat that as a battery. And then there was a second one, which was the membrane voltage defined as a variation in the membrane, the resting membrane voltage um, locally. 
So you have a baseline voltage and then you have a variation voltage. So basically what we're doing is we're normalizing the membrane voltage from minus 65 to zero and saying, yes, we know that there's this starting offset, but it doesn't really matter because that's just a DC value. We're going to take that out and we're just going to look at variations from that baseline value. And then we're going to move from these total variables, which describe the entire membrane, the capacitance of the whole membrane, the resistance of the whole membrane. We're going to move to these incremental variables, where now we're talking about capacitance per unit length and resistance per unit length, and we're multiplying those two values times the length of the unit, which is this delta, this delta Z. And so we have a membrane current per unit length, capacitance per unit length, resistance per unit length, and the membrane voltage locally across that length. Using that equation, we derived the cable equation. And we're able to plug it back into the core conductor equation to say that the second derivative of the membrane voltage locally with respect to Z distance was equal to RO plus RI times the conductivity of the membrane, GM, times VM, the local membrane voltage, plus CM, the capacitance per unit length, times the first derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time, minus RO times this externally applied current KE per unit length. So this was the core conductor, or the cable equation. And from the cable equation, we could solve it, and we did so in lecture 3.5, we solved it for the time-dependent case. In lecture 3.4, we also solved it for the time-independent case, but that wasn't very interesting because really we're looking at signals that vary with time. Those are the ones we're really after. And so for the time-dependent case, we were able to solve the cable equation. And we obtained this equation here. But if we take a step back and we look at action potentials, we see that if you apply a depolarizing pulse to a neuron, what you're going to get is you're going to get initially this passive current this capacitive current as we're charging a capacitor, and that capacitive current is going to move down the uh, axon in both directions, and we can model that flow using the cable equation. And that's interesting, and it's fine as long as we're not exciting an action potential. But what happens when this depolarizing pulse is such that we cross the threshold voltage? When we cross the threshold voltage, suddenly the membrane permeability switches from being permeable only to potassium ions and sitting at the resting memory potential of minus 65 to becoming permeable to sodium ions. Now sodium ions rush into the cell, potassium ions rush out of the cell, and the membrane voltage is restored. But that transient process of initially having sodium ions rushing into the cell and then having potassium ions rushing out of the cell to reestablish the membrane potential, that, that active process is not captured by the cable equation. So we look at the response to this depolarizing pulse, you see this transient inward current, which represents sodium ions rushing into the cell to depolarize the cell, followed by this delayed outward current, representing potassium ions flowing out of the cell, trying to reestablish the rest of membrane potential. And during a normal action potential, this delayed outward current lasts a finite time until the rest of the potential is restored, and then it restores back down to zero. In this particular case, it doesn't come back down to zero because our depolarizing pulse never ends. And as long as we clamp the voltage to zero volts, potassium is always going to be flowing out of the cell because you're never going to have a membrane voltage which creates that electrophoretic force. If you remember back from our derivation of the Nernst equation in lecture 1.5, you're never going to have that electrophoretic force that acts counter equal and opposite to the diffusion force. So the potassium current will flow always. So the question then is, how do you model this? And you do that by drawing a new circuit. That looks very much like the cable circuit. So the cable circuit is, or the new circuit, is the cable C sub m, so the capacitance of the membrane, C sub m, and then now we have the resistor, R sub m, in series with VMQ, except we've taken that and we've replaced it with three parallel equivalent circuits. So we have three resistors in parallel and three VMQs in parallel. And reason we do that is because we're going to break each of these branches up so that each branch describes something different. One branch is going to describe the flow of potassium. One branch is going to f describe the flow of sodium. And then one branch is going to be a fudge factor, so to speak, that describes the leakage of other ion types. Uh, not uh, ions and ion channels primarily associated with potassium and sodium. So 
you have potassium, sodium, and leakage. And for each of these, you have a resistor or a conductor. It's the same thing. Conductance is one over resistance. You have a resistor for sodium or for potassium for sodium and for leakage. And this arrow that we draw through the resistor indicates that that resistor is variable. So the resistance is not a constant anymore as it was before. That resistance is now a function of a number of different variables. It is a function of time. It is a function of the membrane voltage, which is in turn a function of temperature and a number of other factors. So these are variables and getting at what these values are, that's going to be our challenge here. The batteries, VK, VNA, and VL, are essentially VMQ broken up into its NERDS potential for potassium, sodium, and leakage. So under ordinary conditions, when there's no excitation, you would expect that the conductance to sodium would be zero, so this resistor would be infinitely high. The leakage term would be quite close to zero, and this term would be quite close to infinity. And so the only branch that you would see under resting potentials would be these two. You'd see the membrane capacitance in parallel with the resistor, representing the conductivity to potassium, and the membrane is semi-permeable to potassium, so this would be open. It would be, have a very high conductivity, very low resistance, and VK, which would be minus 65 millivolts. So it reduces to the cable model. But when you have an action potential, this conductor will close, and this conductor will open, VNA will take over from VK, and you'll go from minus 65 millivolts to plus 20 millivolts, and then GNA will close, GK will open, and you'll go back to minus 65. So you can see how this might describe the process that we're observing, but we still need to figure out what exactly are these values. And to do that, we go back to the cable equation. So if you look at the cable equation again, it's the second derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to distance squared, is equal to a function of the membrane voltage, the first derivative of the membrane voltage with respect to time, and the applied electrode current. But I have a couple of terms here that I've crossed off to zero. And the reason is because we can go back to the voltage clamp that we talked about on lecture 2.1. And in lecture 2.1, what we said was that you can take a length of axon, and you can put an electrode inside that axon, two of them actually, one from either end, and then one outside that axon. And when this pair of electrodes colored here in green, you can measure the current flowing from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, or rather, sorry, you can measure the membrane voltage from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. Having measured the membrane voltage, Vm, you can compare that to a command voltage and generate a current which will flow back into the cell to force the membrane voltage to be equal to the command voltage. But when you do this, what you're doing is you're making it so that the entire length of the cell has gone from being electrically large to being electrically small because the wire shorts out the interior of the cell. So the same voltage will exist everywhere within the cell, and that means there's no change in voltage as you travel down with distance, which means that the second derivative with respect to distance will go to zero. The other thing that you've done is you've clamped the voltage because what you're interested in doing is measuring changes in the membrane current. But clamping the voltage means that, by definition, the voltage does not change. It does not change with distance because you've shorted out the cell, but it doesn't change with time either because the clamp voltage, the command voltage, doesn't change with time. So as long as you clamp the voltage, the derivative with respect to time will also go to zero. And then what we have is an equation where we have a relationship between GMVM and the applied current. And we can measure the applied current. And then GMVM, well, that's what we're trying to get after. And we do that using the patch clamp. So in lecture 1.3, we talked about this technique for measuring currents inside and outside the cell using intracellular and extracellular electrodes. But then we also talked about this technique called patch clamping, where we took a pipette, a glass pipette, we hold it over a flame, we pull on it so that it becomes thinner and longer in the middle, and then we break it off when it has an inner diameter of just a few microns, and then after polishing it, we can apply it to the surface of the cell membrane, and applying suction, we can get a seal all the way around a specific area of the membrane. And that allows us to isolate individual or small populations of ion channels. If we can isolate small numbers of ion channels, and then we can use uh, neurotoxins like tetrodotoxin or tetraethyl ammonium to block either potassium or sodium ion channels selectively, then we can 
measure not just the membrane current, but we can measure the membrane current of potassium or the membrane current of sodium. And then we can use the equation that we had before and find the conductivity of potassium equal to the ratio of the resistance outside the cell divided by the sum of the resistance per unit length outside and inside the cell multiplied times the applied current, which we know, divided by the membrane voltage, which we can measure. And so having these terms allows us to isolate the terms inside that circuit, that equivalent circuit model. So we can find, we can experimentally determine what the conductance is going to be, and we find, in fact, that there isn't a clean and neat equation, but we can curve fit it, and this is what Hodgkin and Huxley did, and they curve fit G sub K as a function of the membrane voltage and time to be equal to a constant, G K bar, which was equal to about 36 uh, millisiemens per centimeter, uh, multiplied times a function n raised to the fourth power, where n is a function of the membrane voltage and time, and it's of the form x infinity minus x infinity minus x naught, where these are the values of n at the end of time, and currently multiplied times an exponential e to the minus t over tau, where tau is 1 over alpha plus beta, and alpha and beta are both functions of the membrane voltage. So we've taken the core conductor equation, we've applied the equivalent circuit from the cable uh, model to the core conductor equation and arrived at the cable equation, which we know how to solve, but we also know that it doesn't describe active processes inside of a neuron. So we move beyond that, and we look back at the cell and say, okay, if we're after the active processes, then let's not talk about the membrane resistance as being a fixed quantity. Let's talk about the membrane resistance as being a variable quantity, a variable resistor. And furthermore, let's not talk about it as being just membrane resistance, but let's talk about resistance to different sorts of current flow, because we know that ions are selective, ion channels, sorry, are selective to specific ion types. Let's talk about the resistance to potassium and the resistance to sodium and the resistance to everything else, and let's put those in separate brackets. And when we do that, we have a, a branch that describes the membrane capacitance, but we also have, more interestingly, a branch that describes the flow of potassium ions through the membrane, a branch that describes the flow of sodium ions through the membrane, and a branch that describes the leakage term. And if we look at sodium and potassium individually, we can do this by, first of all, using the patch clamp, which allows us to isolate small populations or individual ion channels, and second of all, using neurotoxins like tetrodotoxin and tetraethyl ammonium to block out the ion channels that we're not interested in looking at. So we can block all the sodium ion channels out and then be fairly confident that we're looking at the flow of potassium. We can block out all the potassium ion channels and then patch clamp and be fairly certain that we're looking at the flow of sodium. And we have to be careful to counteract the effects of the flow of calcium and chloride and other ions of interest, but but that's a, that's a reasonable approach to begin looking at these conductances. And then going back to the cable model and the relationship between current, voltage, and conductance, we can find that for varying voltages, we get varying currents, and we can map that relationship. And then measuring those values, we can curve fit those values to find an expression, in this case, for the conductance of potassium as a constant and a function, where that function is a curve fit of the observed data. Now, when we first started out this course, when we did the derivation of the Nernst equation, I made a point of saying that whenever you look at an equation, it's very important to be able to look at that equation and intuitively understand what you're reading. That it shouldn't just be something you memorize, it should be something that you read like a sentence on a page. Those, those, those terms should mean something to you. And that way, you don't have to memorize because you have an understanding of what you need to see and you'll know how to draw that from, um, or derive that from first principles. There are exceptions to that, however, and this is one of them. This equation, or these equations, are not equations you're going to intuitively understand. These are curve fit equations. You're not going to look at the flow of an active signal in a neuronal membrane and say, oh yes, I expect it would be of the form of this equation. This is not an intuitive equation, it is a curve fit equation. But it's just as powerful for all that. And we'll talk in the next lecture about how we derive not just G sub K, but also GNA, and how we put the whole thing together into the Hodgkin-Huxley equation, which we can then 
solve. I'll see you then.